Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, the Wickoff Organization, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, Maringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and these friends. Abruzzi, Italy, Astoria, Astoria, public school. Nah, I'm going to get involved with real estate. Nah, you know, I like real estate, but I also want to be a banker. I want to convert the Steinway building, Eagle Electric building. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to be a community leader. I'm lucky today. I have Joe Pistelli, who is the Chairman and CEO of Pistelli Realty, mm -hmm. and also the Chairman of First Central Savings Bank. Thanks for being here. Mike, right, thanks for having me back. So tell me a little about Grandpa, because Grandpa came over earlier than your father. Yeah, my grandfather came here um, in the 1930s and went to the to the West, the Midwest, and then Vancouver. So did area. he come to New York first, or he, he went no. to the West originally? They went to the West side and into Vancouver, uh, Canada. And uh, worked in mines. And actually, my grandfather, uh, growing up uh, with him, we all lived together at that time. Um, he had what I would refer to a Western twang. So he would speak to you with, uh, I reckon it'll be a nice day today, or uh, with an Italian accent to that. So um, he was a very, very amazing guy. And he was even in the military, right? Yeah. Yeah, he was in cavalry. Was he stationed during the cavalry? I don't recall. I don't remember exactly where. So he's, he's here. With your grandmother? No, my grandmother was in uh, Italy with my father. Okay. We have that wonderful picture of the family going back to Italy, and then we have a picture of when the, the family came over in 1948. Where, um, my father came over, yeah. Your father comes over to live with his father. It was the first time he actually met and saw his father in, eight, in 17, 18 years. He never met him. He had met him on that day, that, so that how photograph. Old, so how old was your dad when he came over? 17, 18 years old. And subsequently, he gets a job as what? A, a laborer, you said to me, right? He's a laborer. Actually, my father also worked in uh, the Eagle Electric Company, um, wiring and piecework for Christmas lights. Any idea how they ended up in Astoria? Well, I just, um, my, my grandfather had, was living there, uh, so that was his first home. And in that area of Astoria at that time was a very uh, strong Italian community. And they all networked with themselves and worked with themselves. And that's where they, that was their groundwork for that particular group of people that came from this um, uh, Abruzzi area. Uh, my mom ended up in 
uh, Thompson Street, and Mel Mulberry, and Sullivan, that area. So they lived where did your mother come from? Where in they it? came from the region, uh, the area called Savignano, which was um, part of Naples, the countryside of Naples. When did mom come over? Around the same period of time. How did mom meet dad? In uh, Little Italy, there was an Italian movie theater, and then my father met her coming out of the movies. And history was made. What was the difference in age of the two of them? They were three years apart. Now, at this time, Grandpa is still working as a laborer. Yeah. And Dad is working also... As a laborer. As a laborer working. But you said to me he was working in, in Queens and up in Westchester? Yeah, my father was a union uh, laborer who then became a union carpenter. Both of them were union uh, workers and in the construction uh, field. My father moved on to uh, a skilled laborer, the carpenter, and... Um, actually worked much more in uh, in Westchester County, but he had a uh, union was in New York City. You were born what year? 53. You lived in the house with your grandparents? Yeah, we all lived together. Was it the, the was it the three family or which one was it you said to me? We had a two family house uh, that we all shared and lived together. It was a six, six room uh, apartment, two family house with a store mixed use. And then next door, my, my grandmother ended up buying next door. So tell me about growing up in Astoria as a kid. Because you did go to public school. You yeah, I went to, to public school. I did religious instruction uh, all the way through the, um, the early communion parts. communion and everything. Yeah, communion, confirmation, all the sacraments, right through marriage. Um, uh, growing up in Astoria was a very nice place. It was an eclectic, um, I, would, I think I would refer to it as an eclectic neighborhood. Many different people. Um, uh, the Italians were there. The Hispanics were there. Um, all different people lived there. But you said you didn't feel missing. You, you know, you, you felt comfortable. Your father uh, was a worker. He was a laborer. But you had a comfortable life. You enjoyed growing up. Yes. You went to Horace Harding, I believe. Yeah, PS10 and Flushing High School. Okay, Flushing High School. Flushing was a little far. Uh, yeah, my parents had uh, moved to uh, Whitestone. Um, I was living with my grandparents still in Astoria. Um, and the reason for that was that it was, I was finishing up certain things that were going on there. Uh, so I would bus it back and forth uh, to Flushing uh, while I still lived in Astoria until they had finished fixing up the house and then we all moved in together. So you graduated high school, and at this time your father has a health problem, right? Yeah. So tell me about the story, because it, it has an effect later on in the future of Pistelli real estate. Yeah, it really does. Um, my father ended up getting sick with uh, gallbladder, um, and he stayed with it for a very long period of time, uh, ill with the symptoms of the gallbladder. Uh, when he uh, was hospitalized, uh, he was in there for, well, I would say, over f about 40-some-odd days. Uh, during the operation, at that time, it wasn't like today, where it's all laparoscopic, it was really, they went in and cut you open, and uh, he had a very severe scar from that. Um, he had, from that surgery, and he may have had it before, but it was said that from the surgery it became, he ended up uh, with a very severe case of diabetes, uh, where he wasn't able to go to work any, any longer. Uh, and that created a tremendous amount of hardship, because also, uh, at that time, we also came to find out that the union benefits, the annuity and insurance policies, and that was uh, supposed to be there for him, uh, were not. Uh, and part of it was administratively that he was a union carpenter to work in New York City, uh, and he worked in Westchester County. And by working in Westchester County, he ended up forfeiting some of that, and then the union had gone bust as well. So the, uh, the financial need to pay for this medical care that he was receiving became a personal burden on us. Um, and that's where it, it is in that trip that we're discussing that Pistilli Realty kind of evolves into a business. Now, Dad had acquired a small building, right? Yeah. And that's, tell me, tell me the story about the building and the, the, the mortgage and the whole story because it... Uh, my father had a building that he had acquired um, for the purpose of his old age. He wanted to own this building, and he owned it for many, many years. It was a... <laughs> six it was a 20-family house, four-story walk-up. Um, and in Astoria, it was in Astoria, and um, 
when he got sick, I approached him because the hospital bills were coming in. They wanted to get paid. And the news coming that uh, he would not be able to go back to work in the construction um, industry um, was very difficult for us. Now, my parents, again, they are, their, their English was limited. Uh, their ways of doing things were very in, in a box, so to speak. Um, and my mother was the type of woman that stayed home, baked bread, and made Sunday dinners. So I had approached my father and said, you know, it may be the best thing for us to do in order to get rid of these bills that keep coming um, to possibly sell this building. Now, the building, at, that, at that time, too, we need to recall, it's not like today. Um, the entire industry was rent controlled. Um, rent stabilization actually comes after the, the, um, that period of time. So you were dealing with people that had $60 rents, $40 rents, and the services were the same services you need to provide today. And he did not want me to sell the property, um, and I, I, I stayed with his wishes. And then, I, and then at some point uh, he did uh, listen to me and said, look, if you think this is the best thing for us to do, um, we would do that. Uh, we ended up selling the property. Um, I knew nothing about the real estate business. But you said you sold the property and you had a second mortgage, right? Yeah, we, found, we had a, a first mortgage uh, with uh, one of the larger institutions in New York, and then uh, we, we placed the second mortgage in order to facilitate the sale. This would provide my father with this additional income. Right, from that, the cash flow. From the cash flow of the second right, mortgage, the mortgage, which was, which was actually more <laughs> than he was making from the rents because they never made money with the rents. And um, we, we, at that time, the, uh, the mortgage was written to allow for an assignment, an assumption of that first mortgage, which is what we passed along. Um, two, three years later, the owner of the, pro the, the, the buyer of the property, the owner of the property, um, ended up losing it, not paying us. And that's how you acquired the property back? Yeah, yeah, we went to auction, we acquired the property back, and that was the realization that for me, uh, and for my dad, I think, that there was, a, there was a business here to be had. Now, what were you doing prior to this when the building was, you know, in, sold? Were you, doing, what were, were you working in? We were working in construction, but we also were able to um, have the court appoint us as the receivers, management and receivership. But you were doing construction yourself at this time. Yeah, we were working, working for a construction so company. So now you take over the property and you decide that there's really a business here. Yeah. Uh, we come to realize that you can buy, sell, and if it goes bad, you can actually take it back. Right. And you're, you're about 20 years of age at this yeah, point. I was about 20 years. I was single. Okay. What happens 10 years later that you decided with a bunch of Greek guys, also in Astoria, needless to say, that there was a need for a new bank. What happens with the, the uh, inception of Marathon Bank? Well, um, I was invited to join a, a group of people that were a, um, a commercial bank in, in organization. Uh, so uh, the, I knew the, the, the members of the, the investment group. I became a part of that group. Uh, and the bank eventually did open up uh, and it was chartered uh, as a national bank. Um, I became a director uh, on the board, along with the, the other group, who were really mainly uh, successful business and professional people who and, got involved and, and, with the bank. And the bank had a need, because the, the Astoria community, the Greek community, had a need for a small community bank. Absolutely. Because at that time, there was only really Atlantic Bank and some others, and it right. was a, a need. Simultaneously, with the exception of Marathon, Pastelli grows, yeah. acquiring properties. So how do you acquire, which is really cute to say, because your dad worked doing some work at Eagle Electric, the Eagle Electric building. Tell me about the Eagle Electric building. The Eagle Electric building um, was uh, vacant for a period of time. The Eagle Electric building was uh, about 45, 50,000 square feet. I'm sorry, about 125,000 square feet. It was three floors the original building. It was spandrel poured concrete, reinforced concrete, built to probably around 1920, 1925. Right near the park. Right near the park um, and protected in, in a way because the park and it's being the whole block uh, won't allow for any construction around it. In, we, want, we tried to buy it a couple of times, was unable to buy it. We, I approached the owners with a leasehold concept. 
I said, if you allow us to lease it from you with the right to develop it into an equity plan, a co-op plan. And the co-op plan versus the condo plan, the only reason why we went that route is because we didn't have a deed. We had a 50-year lease with an option to buy in year uh, 12 and 13, which the co-op eventually bought the property and now has a, 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 a deed, a fee simple deed there. And in addition to the three floors that were there, we took the first two floors, made them into loft apartments, so they're actually a split level, so to speak. Uh, the third floor, uh, we split in half, and we extended the roof line, and we went up three floors with a mansard roof, and the mansard roof basically goes up on a 45-degree angle, so the apartments were, going, were set back all around. And that was really for the point of we didn't want to have, and neither did the community, uh, wanted really this towering building or structure, and we built in the front of it as well. We ended up with a 350 thousand square foot residential building mixed use. And then you also, another building that had uh, notoriety was the Steinway. 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 Steinway, which also then became Stearns, I believe, Stearns. Stearns was there for a while. It was one, it was one of their warehouses. Obviously, they went out of business as well. I bought the building from a family that um, owned the property, and uh, the husband uh, was uh, killed in an aircraft accident on his way to Greece. And um, they were settling up their estate and all, and uh, we ended up uh, approaching them to, to buy the property. Um, and we bought the property, and we converted that into 2,000, uh, 201 uh, condominium apartments. We developed parking. We developed some um, professional space on, on the lower level. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful location. It's on 45th Street on Dittmar's Boulevard. You did some ground-up construction. We did a Newtown, uh, a Newtown office building of 85,000 uh, 85, square feet on Newtown Avenue. So what happens in 1999? Marathon was 1986. Yeah. You're on the board of Marathon. The bank is growing. And at that time, the bank was subsequently acquired by a Greek uh, financial institution. Yeah, part of it was. Part of it was. And you decide with a bunch of people to start the first state chartered savings bank since 1929 yes called first central savings tell me about first central saving well i i think that first i have a passion for the financial service or the banking industry um and a lot of that came from marathon national bank it was a great institution great group of guys um who started something that it's not the easiest thing to get off the ground from a de novo point of view, it's not like they bought a charter. This was actually started from the ground up, as was First Central Savings Bank. Um, and I did, and I still believe that um, small community banks do serve a purpose. But why a savings bank as opposed to a commercial bank? A savings bank at that time, I'm not sure if it's the same today, a savings bank at that time allowed you to have 25, uh, a 25% loan to a borrower, where the uh, commercial charter... Um, only allowed you to do uh, 10%. So there was an advantage of leveraging out to the uh, real estate industry, if it was real estate, uh, collateralized, up to 25%. So how do you find that your first branch, which was a former chemical manufacturer's Hanover Yes, bank? it was. Uh, Whitestone, Queens, on Francis Lewis Boulevard. It, it was uh, a, a branch that came available through a merger and acquisition, unfortunately, but fortunately for me, um, um, one of our real estate uh, people in, in Queens who uh, own it, I think they actually developed the property, uh, I approached them. They wanted, to, they wanted to put another bank there, and it, it became the home of our central savings banks. Great location. So the bank in 1999. April of 99. And there was a number of articles, you know, which basically said that there was a need for the community. I mean, uh, Dave Slackman, who was uh, president of Atlantic's retail branches, said that there was a need in Queens specifically for the community. So the bank, at that time, you, you were the chairman of the bank? I was the chairman and CEO at that time. And over the next couple of years, you opened up, what, seven branches? We had a total of uh, nine locations, where we, would, we have eight now. Now, how did you decide to move your corporate headquarters out of Queens to Glen Cove? 
That was the decision that was really made because uh, we, were, we, were, we were heavily in getting involved in uh, one to four residential lending. And we were buying and selling and buying and selling them. And as the, uh, the company grew and the need for more space and more people dealing with this product, uh, and from a tax base point of view too, it made sense for us to, to, put, to go to the location. So you were doing the one to four and selling them to the government? Uh, we were selling them back to uh, the organized, uh, original. Fannie Mae. Or yeah. So unfortunately, like everything else in banking, uh, when 2008 came around, 2008, 2009 came around, but what happened to the bank at that time? Well, the economy went against us in, in a very big way. Um, we had grown the bank to about $875 million in assets. It was a very profitable bank. Um, but like many smaller banks at that time, regulations changed. The public changed. The public uh, had leveraged itself out it personally itself on uh, commercial real estate. The development side got hurt. Uh, people were doing HELOC loans to buy boats, to buy second homes, and many other reasons. <clears throat> um, we got caught in that trap. Uh, that's but but, unfortunately, but fortunately, not unfortunately, many of the banks who work started, you know, in the 90s, the end of the 90s, like Liberty Point Bank, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and a couple of uh, Lightstone Bank. They weren't able to survive the, the period of time. And you and your management team and your directors really stood in over there. And for the past, you know, fortunately, right now, the bank is profitable, mm -hmm. running good operation. And you're still involved with the bank as the chairman. Yes, I am. I think uh, a lot of that uh, I'd like to give credit to, and I think it's, it's important to give credit to, because I think along the way uh, the regulators have received um, maybe sometimes a hard hand. And, and I think that they were able to at least recognize the passion of the bank behind the bank and uh, allowing us to raise capital, put capital in, and fix the problems going forward. And I think at the end of the day, um, the FDIC and, and DFS uh, should be proud because they were a big helping hand in allowing us to right. survive. And, and I, and I mean, I, we did it on our own at the no, end no, of the no, day. No, 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 but I, but I think community needed the bank, okay, because there aren't community banks, okay? You know, TD is a wonderful bank, but they're a large Canadian operation. There aren't small banks, you know, today, they were credit unions, but recently two of them right. who served this type of community also, not, not doing the same type of loans, but served the community and no longer here because what happened with the taxi industry. So when a bank is out there taking care of the local merchants, the local bodega, taking care of the other community needs, that's really important. Then. Hey, but you know, Mike, and you touch upon something uh, with the other two banks um, that had a mission statement. They had a niche uh, um, borrower, and they lend it in a, in a very niche market, which, you know, overnight changed um, considerably. So I, I think in as much as com small community banks are needed and need to find a niche, I think when it comes to niche lending or, or any type of niche, you really do need to be able to begin with that niche to be a philosophy, a culture. It's not just to say that we're going to oversaturate whatever we're doing in barbershops or shoe stores or bars or restaurants. Uh, any over-concentration of anything in the banking business is, is going to send up red flags because it's like anything else. What's good today may not be that great tomorrow. Um, so I think that uh, what the regulator is looking for today is if it, to, for you to find a niche. And I think community banks, small community banks like First Central are, are, are very necessary because like you said, whether it's TD or another bank, a large bank, regardless of where they come from, they can't really serve the need of a small businessman because he's not sophisticated enough. Right, and, and the banks, the large banks look at it that it's not worth the headache because they're... And but why take the risk? It's a, Let's talk a little bit about family and the next generation of the Pistellis in the real estate. Business. I love that. Okay, so tell me about the kids. Uh, my daughter just got married. Right. Uh, she married someone in the business. Uh, really nice son-in-law. I couldn't have gotten a, a better uh, son-in-law. 
Uh, she works in the business. She's vice president of uh, customer service. Uh, that's Lindsay. My, my son, Michael, is also uh, vice president. He oversees, actually, our uh, Bronx portfolio uh, on the residential side. Um, and I have my brother's three uh, children, my niece, uh, Gina, uh, her husband, Larry, who I dragged along today. And uh, my uh, two nephews, Michael and Anthony, they, they also are in the, um, on the residential Queens, Brooklyn side. Uh, my son, my, my uh, nephew, Larry, takes care of a professional and commercial space. And a little residential in the Bronx. So, so what, do you, what, do you, what do you want to do when you grow up, Joe? I want them to send me a check. So wait, so you, <laughs> so you want to follow the same thing that your father was, what he did when he bought the first building, right? Yeah, I, I would say that. Yeah, uh, but I, I would say you know for the kid, uh, the Astoria kid, who you know you didn't tell me how you ended up in Flushing. Now I understand because of the movement over there. Um, it's fortuitous in a way. The dad got ill that you were able to learn and gain in the real estate business. It's fortuitous also that, you know, you've, you've served the need of building apartments in a neighborhood that today that everybody wants to be in Queens and everybody wants to be near Astoria. It's a great place. And, and s since I toured the building, <clears throat> you know, the Eagle Electric, I saw the quality of the work in the community. And I'm happy that all the kids and everybody are healthy in the family. And thanks for being here today. I just want to touch one thing that I think is important. I, mean, I didn't get in, um, the relationship that my brother and I had, my brother Tony, and he really does the uh, outside structure of the operation side. Uh, we've had a relationship and, and a, uh, a chemical that really has made that work. And I hope that the kids can really find among themselves who plays one in each part. But if you look at that picture of your father coming over from Italy, and the family, that's what the Pistelli family is yes, years ago, and that's what it's going to be today and in the future. I love that. Thanks for being here. Mike, thanks again.